Let's begin with warp. I'm going to create a cylinder and we'll give it some height subdivisions. So we have some geometry to work with. I'll hit accept there. Head over to deform and select warp. We have three different flavors. I zoom in a little bit here. There's bend, flare and squish, and twist. You can either bend it with a slider or you can grab this little handle. Positive and negative values are allowed and you can go as far as a full circle in terms of the deformation. You can rotate the bend deformer. You can move it up and down, side to side. It's gonna have this upper bound and lower bound. You can see the, the little yellow circle there or a semicircle, how that's uh, having an impact. We'll set these back to the defaults. Flare and squish. Actually, I'm gonna cancel out and we'll just make a new one just so the transform is in the right spot there. Same deal, you can modify the, uh, the effect of the deformer. You can change how it's gonna behave. Sign mode, squared sign mode. It's probably just a tighter fall off. Triangle mode. And for twist, that's gonna be pretty obvious. We're just gonna get a little twist on there. The next thing I wanna talk about is displace, but I need a fairly dense piece of geometry. So we can make a rectangle. I'll set the width and depth subdivisions to 100 each. We'll hit accept. This piece of geometry has 20,000 triangles. Go ahead and rotate it and we can freeze the transforms. We're gonna be using this for a couple of demos. So here in Deform, if I go to Displace, by default, it's going to be using a Perlin Noise. There are some other options. I'll talk about those in a second. With the Perlin Noise, there are, yeah, we are Perlin Noise layer properties. There are essentially four different Perlin Noises that are being laid on top of each other. And if you want, you can get in and modify these to make the actual displacement look very different. So I'm just gonna set the intensity for the bottom three to zero. So you can see the top one is gonna be this fairly large waveform and the frequency is fairly small, right? So like as the frequency gets larger, you can see 0 0.25, 0 0.5 and, and one, that the, uh, the noise that we're generating is going to be, I don't know, noisier, right? So that's how you could get in and modify something. If you just want like a nice gentle deformation, it's pretty easy to achieve that. Okay, let's go back to the top here. The other option that I use all the time is a texture 2D, and I've already got a texture sitting here. So something you should hopefully be able to cook up in Photoshop without too much trouble. And I'm gonna drop it in here to displacement map. And you can see, obviously it's rotated a little bit off, but we can modify the amount of the displacement. Do positive and negative. And you can pick what channel. So a uh, pro tip here, you go to, uh, if you've used any Megascan surfaces, got one here that will work. If you grab the, there's gonna be like an ORD map or something, basically their combo map, and you drop that in, typically the blue channel is going to be displacement. So if you just tell it you wanna use the blue channel, you'll get something that you can actually use that's, uh, that's fairly useful. Now it's displacement, so it's essentially like a height map. It just goes in one direction forward or backwards or up and down. You don't really get any underhangs, but this can still be really, really nice for making tiling geometry that you can use for landscapes or whatever, if you don't want to use displacement, like real-time nanite displacement. Anyway, that's a, a very, very useful trick and super easy to set up using displace. The next thing I want to talk about is lattice. You can set the number of subdivisions in the three axes. And uh, this is just a plane, so one of these has got five stacked up pretty tight there. But if you ever use the lattice in any other tool, it's gonna to be pretty much exactly the same as it is here. Go ahead and just grab some points and move them around. You can rotate, move, or scale. There are gonna be two interpolation type options, linear, which is the default, and cubic. And you can see with cubic, we start to get some nice smooth transitions as the geometry moves through our lattice deformer. So the next thing we can look at here is going to be voxel. We'll do a voxel wrap. 
I'm going to go ahead and apply this uh, text here as a displacement. We'll hit accept there. So this is just a 2D plane, so it's going to have holes in the back. What Voxel does is very similar to Dynamesh. If we go to Voxel Wrap, it will actually remove any edges that are very, very thin and replace them. It'll do its best to kind of fill that in. And it's going to be essentially approximating 3D space with little cubes. If I turn on the wireframe here, you can see the size of those cubes. And it just trims whatever the object is through those cubes. So if you have like a 2D plane, it's going to get nuked. But anything that has some depth where it can figure out what's going on will be preserved. You can see here in the back of that, oh, there's some problems. The resolution isn't great. You can control the size of those cubes here with voxel count. I'll go back to the wireframe. So the bigger this number gets, like if I were to increase it to 256, what we're essentially going to do is cut the size of our cubes here, our 3D space cubes, to one quarter of their current size. So if I hit enter, we should see it'll calculate for a bit. And those cubes get one quarter of their original size. And we get a little bit more of that resolution preserved. You can continue on here. So if I set this to 512, we'll let that cook for a second. So I guess at 512, we're starting to preserve some of the, the actual plane there itself. But you can see we're getting a, a much tighter cube shape there, right? So let's go back to solid. So this can be a really useful operation. I'm going to drop it back down to the default 128. This could be a really useful operation if you want to remove any internal faces. You could also just put a box back here and kind of clean, do a, do a Boolean and clean that up fairly simply. And if you increase the resolution of the input geo, some of this stuff here would be a little bit cleaner as well. So this is, this is really useful. I'm going to go ahead and hit accept. And if I did want to clean up the back, I guess I can, I can just show you that super quick. I'm just going to make a box. We'll drop it back there. Kind of scoot it so we get some intersection. Select the text and the box. A minus B. And there you go. Nice and clean, right? Okay, so this is really useful, but you may notice that we no longer have a checkerboard on here. And the reason for that is we have lost our UVs. When you voxelize something, the UVs are going to get deleted. So we're going to need to create new UVs. Fortunately, that is very easy to do. Over here in the UV section, there are a variety of tools. The one that I like the best is Project UVs. The only thing you need to modify is, unless you want a planar projection, it's just to create a box projection. And then it's going to scale this according to the bounding box. If you want to get a consistent projection, you can just pipe in the same value for everything. And that's going to act just like a nice kind of automatic UV projection, which is very, very convenient. You can get into the UV editor if you want and do significantly more detailed updates. This mesh is probably pretty dense, so it's going to take a second to populate. Right. So if you wanted to come in and, you know, grab a shell and scoot it around, you can do all that kind of stuff here. Lots of different operations, very similar to the kinds of UV operations that you might find in a DCC tool like Maya. The next thing I want to show you how to do is how to assign materials. I have some materials that I use in my project here, and I'm going to come down to the attributes and edit materials. So by default, we have one material assigned, the world grid material. I can go ahead and pop that in. Everything will turn gold. If I want to add a second material, uh, we'll just use this fireball here. I can do that and then I just need to select, you can either do like a, a painting thing, similar to when we were doing our poly groups. I think you can set this to all in or all connected. So that's an easy way to kind of do something like this. And then you just want to come over to this active material, set it to whatever you want to assign, and then you come down to assign active materials. And there you go. It looks like the gold didn't take on the actor, but I bet if I grab the asset itself, 
you can see the, uh, the gold is assigned there. So that's how to change the material configuration on a mesh very, very easily if you want. The next thing I want to show you is how to create collision for your new geo. I'm going to select mesh to collision here in the attributes menu. And by default, I'm going to get a bounding box. You can set it to a bounding box per mesh element here in the input mode to get a little bit more control. Can it cancel there? You can also create your own geometry to use as collision. The pivots have to be in the same spot. So if I paste the location into my collision geo, that's how the collision will be applied to the mesh. Once you've got it set up like that, they don't have to be in the same spot. You want to select your collision mesh first. You can have more than one mesh. And the last thing that you select is the target. I'm going to go mesh to collision. We can set this back. Other than line boxes, I'm going to select convex holes and then per mesh component. Deselect detect boxes in this case. You can go ahead and turn these other guys off too. And then in order to get the resolution a little bit higher, you just need to increase your max holes per mesh. So I'll set that to two. And you can see the result looking pretty good there. I'll hit accept. You don't need to keep this around if you don't want. Now I can go ahead and double click on our new static mesh, go to show and simple collision and you can see there it is applied to our static mesh. The next thing that I want to talk about here is bake. You can bake vertex colors or textures. The process is very, very similar to say Substance Painter. I'm just going to bake the vertex colors in this example. The output mode can be RGBA or per channel. And for per channel, you can say what you want going into each channel. So the curvature has some settings here you can modify, but the quality isn't great. It's okay, but uh, you'll get better results in other tools. But the ambient occlusion is actually pretty good. It's going to have uh, 16 occlusion rays by default. If you set this to like 128, you'll see it gets a little bit nicer. So the quality that I can get from the AO bake in Unreal is identical to what I can get in Maya. You just have to increase the values a little bit. So very, very useful to be able to do this directly in Unreal. And once again, this is something that we can definitely access via geometry scripting. And we'll be taking a look at that in a, just a few videos. We can go ahead and accept that. If you're working in a project that has source control, you may want to export your final geo out so that you can check it in. Uh, you can do that very simply by right clicking, going to asset actions, and then selecting export. And it'll just export the FBX wherever you tell it to go. All right, so we have covered a ton of stuff here in the modeling mode. We have created primitives, working with transforms, deformations, polygroup editing operations, simplify and remesh, voxelization, baking, UVs, and then setting up collision and materials. There's a lot more in here that I haven't covered, but hopefully this gives you enough of a foothold that you can get in and, and start finding these features for yourself. And uh, hopefully this will save you a few trips back to your trusty DCC. You can do it directly here in Unreal, which is a huge time saver. So in the next few videos, we are going to do a little bit of an intro series on uh, how to work with blueprints in Unreal, because we'll be leveraging a lot of that stuff later on in the course. So stick around for that. Can't wait to see you there. Thank you very much.